Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the 82nd live program on orthopedic principles. We are back with Dr. Ajit Apuhami from Sri Lanka. Dr. Apuhami completed his FRC Strom and Orth and EBOT exams in the UK, and he works as a consultant now in Sri Lanka. He's known for his FRCS programs, and today it's my great honor to have Dr. Apuhami with us. Over to you, Dr. Apuhami. Okay, good evening, Hitesh, and good evening, my dear friends and colleagues. Today, I will discuss about Paget's disease. So why I selected this topic, it's very important because in FRC's orthopedic, from orthopedic exam, there are a few hot topics you need to know. So out of that hot topic, this Paget's disease come to the top. So it will be questioned everywhere throughout your FRCS exam, even part one and part two exam, especially in the viva table. So especially in the adult pathology table. So they, I would say definitely, I will use that word definite because it's very hot topic. So at some point you would be questioned in your viva table. So mainly in the adult pathology table. So. I can remember in viva table, even the basic pathology, there was a small segment, they talk about their principles of the pathophysiology in my exam. And then it was a full question in the adult pathology, viva table. And sometimes it would be a case scenario. You will get the Paget's disease patient with the hip arthritis, with the underwent surgery. So there are so many things they can examine, can discuss with you. And I will discuss uh, here, uh, what are the possibilities, uh, possible areas questioned in the MCQs, and what are the key areas, especially in the viva table, examinable question from here? Because this topic is, they will not ask the basic, their uh, pathophysiology, their theory part, but this is the area they will assess your practical knowledge whether you have come across or whether you have experience and whether you are a safe surgeon to think about all possibilities and to expect all technical problems and how do you face. So that is uh, something uh, assess your frontal knowledge uh, under this topic. So if I go to that, we'll start with the basic uh, uh, areas. What is Paget's disease? You need to know it is a kind of metabolic condition which is associated with the abnormal remodeling. So, you know, I will not discuss in detail what is you know, remodeling here because I already discussed in my bone biology topic. So what is remodeling? So it is a balance between osteoblastic and osteoclastic function. So if it is not happening in the very balanced way, it becomes abnormal. So it is a kind of a localized chronic osteopathic disease because of this abnormal remodeling that leads to uh, develop structural weakness and it produces more bone hypervascularity. And because of this weakness and abnormal remodeling, they form deformities and subsequently they alter the joint mechanics, biomechanics. Because due to deformity formations of the mechanical axis, so that affects the joints and, and that they alter the alter joint biomechanics and then uh, it develops premature or secondary osteoarthritis. So if you know that definition and what are the components affecting the bone part, then, then you are safe at the beginning of this discussion. So there are two types. This, this is polyostatic and monostatic. That polyostatic is quite common, 83%, and monostatic only, 17%. When you talk about a little bit about epidemiology, it has bimodal distribution at uh, over 40 years, about 4%, and over 90s, about 10%. Etiology, you need to know a little bit about, there is no certain uh, etiology because it's not known, but there are some pre, uh, proposed theories. There are three Three theories they discuss viral causative factors, genetic and environmental causes. When you talk about the viral causes, it could be paramyxo virus such as measles virus, respiratory syncytial, and canine, canine destemper virus. So, this canine destemper virus could be an MCQ in your 
FRP is part one exam because it's a very common MCQ. And genetic factors, about 40%, 5 to 40% patients have a first degree relative with this disease. When you come to the environmental factors with the arsenic, it has a high relationship. And there are some uncertain association with the cats and dogs. If you know these things are related under the etiology, that's more than enough. So I briefly touched this uh, pathophysiology part because I, as I have discussed this bone biology in detail, my previous lectures, I will not go into spend more time here. So as I said before, it's the abnormal remodeling. So it, it's very disorganized bone formation happen. It is not like a, a normal lamella bone. It is basically kind of a wooden bone. So this disorganized uh, bones that increase the osteoclast function. You start with the osteoclast function, increasing osteoclast function and start with bone resorption. Then subsequently as a compensatory mechanism, it develops osteoblastic function and form new bone formation. So because of that, it accelerates and chaotic bone, uh, chaotic bone remodeling happens. So this disorganized pattern it helps to change the biomechanics of the bone and bones become very weak and become more deformed and it's more prone to get fractures. There are less resistance and these are more elastic than typical lamina bone. So there's a sequel of this for me. As I said before, you start with osteolith, uh, osteoclast function. They form more resorptions and bone become very lytic. That is called lytic phase. Then after that, subsequent day, what happened as a compensatory for that lytic stage, what happened, there's an increased activity of osteoblast and they start new bone formation. That it's, it's a concur concurrently lytic and uh, uh, new bone formation happened. So it become mixed phase. The latter part, what happened, uh, they decrease the lytic stage that decrease the activity of osteoclast and which override by osteoblast functions and form new bones and they form bones become very sclerotic. So that is called sclerotic phase. Do you, you need to know there are three phases in this is lytic, mixed and sclerotic. So what is the clinical manifestation? So what I, how I remember that there are orthopedic manifestation and non-orthopedic manifestation. So orthopedic manifestations manifestation of bony pain, arthritis, as I said before, there's a high chance of getting secondary osteoarthritis and uh, spinal deformities. I will discuss what are the radiological changes. So, and there's another way I easy to remember, I divide in A, B, C, D, and P3 and M2. So A means arthritis, B increase the blood flow, as I said before, it increase the bone hypervascularity that increase high cardiac output, cardiac failure. So there is some blood flow complications. C mean cranial nerve compression is possible because some bony changes of the skull that compress the foramina, bone, cranial foramina. So it's a, those foramina give the outlet for the cranial nerve that will compress and give symptoms. And bone deformity, especially in the long bones and the spine, uh, vertebra, spinal vertebrae. And P3 is pain, P3 means pain, it's pathological because it's, bones are not quite strong. It's those are brittle bones, so a high chance of getting pathological fractures. And with the fracture, they develop pseudoarthrosis. M2, they get the metabolic abnormalities as it's a metabolic disease. And later on, but this last but not least, it's possible to get some malignant changes like Paget sarcoma, osteosarcoma, and so on. We'll discuss a little bit about X-ray changes because if you need this background uh, knowledge to uh, uh, face your viva exam. So if you know this, what are the, in radiologically, if you know these, these features are, okay, this is Paget's disease. To get into the diagnosis, it is important you need to know the radiological finding. After diagnosis only, then you have to go for a uh, more discussion about the disease and what are the technical issues and how do you face those. So in the pelvis, what are the changes, especially that becomes bones become very uh, coarse, trabeculae and thickened bone. And we can see the brim sign, we call that brim sign thickening of the iliopecnial and iliosteal line. And usually it is a little bit, uh, sometimes it's, uh, uh, very often it is asymmetric, not sometimes, sorry. 
Very often it is asymmetric. So we can see the thickening of the bone and thickening of the cortex uh, and uh, large bone. And another thing, Felis, you can see uh, astibular potrucio. So it's very common presentation in the uh, presentation in uh, Paget's disease in pelvic. Uh, most of the time, they will give the potrucio extra pelvic extra, and they will carry on the viva discussion. So how, do you need to know how to diagnose potrucio? So I will not discuss astibular potrucio here because it's a separate topic. But I will just mention you need to know what is collars line if it is proximal migration of the head and com compare this and this line. This is called collars line, the upper border of this foramen. So it will go and this side, right side, it is not migrating through this uh, line, but you can see clearly it is migrating. So it is called portrush of the acetabula head. So it is a common presentation from Paget's disease. So what are the long bone changes? We can see the deformity formation is quite common in the femoral proximal part of the femur. And you can see here that very thick irregular sclerotic bony cortex, and this is called candle flame uh, shape lesion. Candle flame shape lesion or V-shaped lytic lesion we can see. And we can see the bowing of the, it's a lateral bowing is quite common in the femoral bones. And we can see the cox aware deformity in the proximal part. So if you if you mention these radiological findings uh, because of so and so, so I will assume this is a Paget disease. So so you have scored the mark. You can easily score mark. So this uh, long bones is a tibia has an anterior bone, and it has you can see that the loss of corticomedullary differentiation is very. Uh, loss of uh, corticomedal differentiation. And if you mention those things, then you can see some lytic lesion and thicken of the cortex. If you mention this, this features more towards Paget, so I assume this is Paget disease. So, so examiner would be very happy about that. And then skull changes you need to know. So it's enlargement of the skull and you can see some lytic lesion that is called osteophoresis circumscription. And so you can see the cotton wool appearance. That's a mixed pattern of the lytic and blastic pattern in the thickened calvarium. So you can see here, this picture clearly shows that cotton wool appearance. And thickening of the diploid, that uh, inner plate and the outer plate is quite wider. So that is a typical feature of this um, uh, Paget's disease. And the base of the skull, we can see the thickened sclerosis and that forms the deformed formation at the narrowing of the cranial foramina. So spinal changes you need to know. So you can see some thick outer, outer cortex, outer brim of the, the verte this vertebrae become very large and it's become square shape. And here, here picture it's clearly shows this outer brim is very sclerotic and we can see the radial loosened in the inner portion. So that is called photo frame appearance. So if you know, and if we go into that is, in, that is a mixed phase. When you go to the very sclerotic phase, that vertebrae become very ivory. So this is a hand X-ray. If you, if you can see the thickening of the outer cortex and the radial loosened inner cortex. So those are the features, radiological features. I mentioned this because you need to know radiological features, differentiate, and to dis start, carry on your discussion. So you need to have a diagnosis. So the basically it's a radiological diagnosis. So, so that's why uh, discuss in detail what are the possible radiological features. Now, if you go into the complications of this Paget's disease, so it's very common bone pain because it's a it's a metabolic disease. In the acute stage of the disease, they present and their patient complain of bone pain. So it is very common. So I will tell because this bone pain, we need to differentiate from bone pain and other. Uh, clinical presentations in this Paget's disease. So it is important to diagnose and do the appropriate management. So bone pain and second osteoarthritis because of the, as I said to you before, alter of the biomechanics of the joint that develop uh, premature, uh, that immature osteoarthritis. 
then uh, due to vertebral body changes they can get the compression fractures because bone become very brittle and it's very fragile so high chance of getting fractures and even the long bones we can get commonly insufficiency fractures and spinal stenosis is quite common that is called pagetic spinal stenosis patient will come pain of core sciatic features sciatic pain sciatic pain and due to compression of the cord cord diaphragm and spinal root compression and enlargement of the skull deformity can develop cranial nerve in increased cranial pressure intracranial pressure and hydrocephalus and sometimes cranial root deficit so at uh, and uh, cardiac output problems due to uh, increased bone vascularity and at last i would say uh, some malignant changes like osteosarcoma and chondrosarcoma that suggests that okay now we'll go into the management plan so when you come to this management <coughs> this paget disease always you have to mention this keyword it's a multidisciplinary approach there should be orthopedic surgeon there should be a rheumatologist to manage in the acute stage and uh, this occupational therapist physiotherapist it's a multidisciplinary approach <coughs> then what is the medical management medical management is very important i will tell why i am mentioning this medical management because even we need to know this medical component but usually what we are doing we to identify the patient and we need to assess the patient this disease at the acute stage then we need to start medical management before surgical management so medical management there are first line and second line treatment <coughs> first line treatment is a bisphosphonate you need to know what is the bisphosphonate function what are the old generation and new generation how they act each separately i will not discuss here but you need to know this uh, this old generation example alendronate etitronate so they usually act to the both blastic and osteoclast new generation could be pemetronate is iv uh, mod so you can it in it osteoclast so basically it affect for this uh, remodeling process especially for the bone resorption part the second line treatment is a calcitonin is a, it could be subcutaneous and inter, uh, intramuscular so it directly acts to the osteoclast and that shrinks within minutes it's a very acutely you it, it's very transient they give their effect so this is an mcq it's a teriparatide it's a contraindication for the pagetic because it's risk of osteosarcoma it's a very common mcq in emphasis span why this medical management is so important because if it's acute stage patient the the disease in the acute stage but on top of that we are going to do the surgery now imagine patient has a severe osteoarthritis with the pagetic disease if you are going to do the total hip replacement at the acute stage there's a high risk of bleeding because it has a hypervascularity in the bone so so it we are taking a risk so at that stage it's very important rather than we straight straight we going to do the surgery we need to wait for that put the patient to the dormal stage with the uh, shared management with the rheumatologist start medical treatment at least for 3 months so then convert into dormal state and go ahead with the surgery because this medical management is important that will reduce the uh, intraoperative bleeding and that will reduce heterotrophic calcification and that will reduce the loosening of the implant because aseptic loosening is the commonest complication in uh, arthroplasty surgery especially in the pagetic disease patient so we can minimize it by giving medical treatment beforehand and uh, before the surgery okay this is the very important area in my lecture because usually in your exam they will show you this kind of x ray yeah they will show you this kind of x ray and they will ask can you explain this x ray 
And then you have to mention about this increase in osteosclerosis and potential lesions and brain science. All these features suggest you of Paget's disease. And you need to come to it. Okay, this is possibly Paget's disease. Okay, then they will ask, how do you manage this patient? And what are your concerns? That's how your viva table starts. They will not straight away ask, okay, what is Paget's disease? Uh, what is pathophysiology? No, that stage is over in the, when you come to the th stage, uh, this paper two, uh, this uh, uh, part two exam. Because that, that theory part will assess in your part one and even the practical part. But come to this level, they will ask, what are the technical issues? They will concentrate they will assess your practical knowledge. So if you are going to do the total hip replacement for the Paget disease, so its indication would not change because we are doing total hip replacement for debilitating joint pain, affecting day-to-day -day activities, and which is not responsible for conservative management, we need to treat with hip replacement. But the, here, it's very important concept if patient come and tell about hip pain, we need to differentiate whether this hip pain is purely due to secondary osteoarthritis related with Paget disease, or whether this pain patient tells the pain what patient express is that due to bone pain. It's not arthritic pain, it's a bone pain because it's a Paget disease per se, they develop pain which is called bone pain at the acute stage of the disease. If you go ahead and do the surgery for the hip, uh, do the hip replacement for the patients having bone pain with acute stage of acute Paget's disease, so that will not be the solution for the patient's complaint. So it's very important, few things to exclude before you go and touch the patient for the hip replacement. That's, that's the key area I want to touch in this lecture. Because we need to exclude acute pain, uh, this bone pain in acute Paget's disease. And we need to exclude insufficiency fractures. Because insufficiency fractures are quite common in Paget's disease because of the brittle, flexible bone. Other thing is, sometimes it could be a referred pain, some neurological compressions of the uh, in spine. So that will represent down as a referred pain. So patient misinterpret is the hip pain. Another thing is a Paget sarcoma. If the older patient come and tell the hip pain, we have to think about possibility hip, hip pain in the Paget disease patient, we have to think about Paget sarcoma as well. Those are the four things we need to exclude before we touch the patient and before we go ahead and do the surgery. After excluding, we need to confirm this is a joint arthritic pain. So I will tell one by one, how do we exclude and how do we confirm this arthritic pain? Then we can safely go and do the surgery. Then once we decide to do the surgery, then there are a few more things you need to know. What are the technical issues? How do you overcome this? Pain? Okay. Assess the activity of the disease. We need to see whether the patient is in the acute stage. Because if you do the surgery in the acute stage, that will not be the answer to the patient's complaint. If you do the surgery in the acute stage, that will bleed during surgery. So it's a high risk of bleeding. And if you do the surgery in the acute stage, there's a high risk of getting heterotrophic ossifications following surgery. So that will not give the intended outcome with the total hip replacement. If you do not, um, it, it will not give the outcome. So how do we investigate? There are blood, we have to assess clinically, history. What is the pain? What is it exactly? Whether it's an arthritic pain or whether it's a non-arthritic pain, we need to identify. In the investigation side, we need to know, we do alkaline phosphatase because it increases alkaline phosphatase. Then urine hydroxypolyne increases in the acute stage. Urine collagen crosslinks increase with the acute stage, and urine entelepeptide, C-telepeptide, and deoxy 
deal knowledge increases in the acute stage if you do this investigation it increase that indicate that the patient is in the acute stage of fatty disease and it's very important calcium and phosphate usually stay in the normal uh, level because that is a, um, in fatty disease it is not related to the calcium metabolism it is it is a different uh, this uh, this pathology is uh, some remodeling process so then after with this investigations and after with this uh, after the clinical findings if you suspect is the acute say then you can go ahead do the bone scan to see the hot spot if it's a hot hot spots in the lytic stage and the mid stage and we can see the cold in the sclerotic stage so likewise we need to identify the patient's acute stage then we have to refer to the rheumatologist and start medical treatment bisphosphonate and give her treatment for 3 months at least and reevaluate the patient assess the patient's outcome clinically and investigate once the patient transfer from acute to dormant stage then we have to think about that go ahead with the surgery if the patient is persistent with the same treatment so that is how we need to exclude acute disease and uh, start medical treatment then insufficiency fractures again we have to get the good adequate x rays good quality x rays full length x rays and we have to look for the deformities of the femur and how extend the bone involvement and we have to look for the stress fractures this is quite common in the femoral neck and the trochanteric region if the femoral shaft if the shaft fracture we can see the tension side is very common to get the insufficient stress fractures if it is not uh, clearly visualized in the x-ray if you still doubt about the insufficiency fractures if patients contain some trivial injury or something then you can go with the uh, ct scan we can do the tri dimensional constructive ct scan and then you have to treat accordingly for that first before the total hip replacement okay then other possibility is a canal stenosis this canal stenosis it due to sometimes the spinal problem is radiating down and patient complain of hip pain so we have to get the detailed history examinations of the spine then look at for the x ray spine then you have to go for mri scan and then treat accordingly uh, combined with the your spinal surgeon the pages this is if you suspect if you suspect pages sarcoma so we have to get the again detailed history examination you have to do the tumor workout i will not discuss in detail this how to, what is tumor workout and this tumor management plan here because that's a different vast topic so i will discuss later on one of my lecture later but i will just mention you need to mention that i will exclude phages sarcoma before touch the patient with the total for the totally before touching the patient for the surgery so then examiner knows okay you have a sound idea about the uh, that exact natural history of the disease and you are a safe surgeon so if you can give this message to the patient thinking this vast area excluding this condition then it will indicate you know exactly what is phages and you know how to deal with that so in the if you found this uh, in the tumor workout then you get to do the appropriate all imaging studies and do the biopsy and get to know again multidisciplinary team oncologist and tumor so uh, do the management Pat pathologist and oncology involvement again it's a multidisciplinary team management then now once we exclude all these possibilities then we have to confirm whether it's arthritic pain from uh, other pain what you can do you can get the history and then you can go ahead and do the <clears throat> some local anesthetic injections to the hip joint under steral procedure under cm guided you can do if they give a good response that is more suggestive of arthritic pain but if it's not respond then you have to work it for other causes or sometimes this is some controversial area you need to remember sometimes the cv osteoarthritis i would say grade 2 osteoarthritis sometimes it will not respond for the local anesthetic so that case so we have to be a little bit doubtful and we have to get the decision but 
this is a good way uh, it's a good way to if you tell this option to the pay, uh, your examiner then your examiner would be very impressed about your judgment so okay now we go to the what are the technical issues when you are performing total hip replacement of paget tissue now once you have excluded all these possibilities now you are ready to go ahead with the uh, total hip replacement then you have to there are few more things you have to have a proper pre operative template because this is not a this is not a simple total hip replacement it's almost equal to revision surgery because it's a deformed bone and it's very sometimes it's a protrusion associated uh, acetabulum so it is a complex total hip replacement so you have to do the proper pre operative templating and you need to plan about component size component type and sometimes we may need the amount of cement is because the medullary canal is quite large is a large bone so you have to plan everything and next thing you have to think about the excessive bleeding so as i said to you before it's a hypervascular bone so you need to discuss with the anesthetic beforehand what are the possibilities and you need to you need to be ready with cross match blood before so just sometimes pre donation of so autologous blood beforehand and you have to think about giving tranexamic acid during surgery if you mention these these possibilities so that shows how you think soundly about this procedure so examiner would be very impressed and another thing is uh, these bones are quite hard and sclerotic it's not the normal bone so it's that it's technically it be very difficult reaming broaching would be very very difficult sometimes you may have to use a bird to enter to the bone prior to reaming sometimes we have to use very sharp reamers so if you mention this is time to be to start those are the technical issues if you uh, practically go and do the hip replacement of the paget disease tip and next thing is the coxa vera deformity is quite common in the proximal end of the femur so if you because of the various deformities it leads to get the various positions of your implant because prosthesis position is because we do it to restore we have to stick on our principles of total hip replacement we have to restore the center of rotation we have to restore the mechanical axis we need to restore the uh, leg, leg length everything so to think of that we need to avoid these uh, various positions of the prosthesis another thing is a broad spectrum deformities in the proximal femur or acetabulum sometimes this may lead to dislocations of the hip it's very common if you do not position the implant so we have to think about that and next thing is uh, adequate exposure is very important because if you don't do so better to go for a posterior fold or sometimes you go for hard in so we have to think about trochanteric costure and next thing is when you are dissecting the sciatic nerve is quite near to the joint rather than in the normal hip so we have to be concerned about that also then sometimes uh, because of this bony deformity because of the lateral curvature of these uh, uh, femoral shaft due to coxa vera deformity sometimes we may have to do the concurrent osteotomies it's a very difficult then it's technically very difficult and it become very prolonged procedure if you are going for a cement in fixation if they are doing the concurrent osteotomy there is a possibility of extravasation of cement so you if you mention all these technical problems that make your answer is very complete and another thing you have to think about heterotrophic calcification because we have to do the very meticulous careful dissection achieve hemostasis and prophylactic treatment for vitamin c that uh, we can start before high and you can discuss with your anesthetic and mentions about uh, ask him to maintain hypertensive anesthesia throughout the procedure to minimize bleeding so those are very key thing and vital steps to avoid some such a huge complication and as i said before <clears throat> we have to be very alert we have to be very careful in the handling disease and when you are broaching because bones are very brittle there is a possibility of intraoperative or postoperative fractures so you need to ready about possibility of intraoperative fractures you need to be ready with the instrument and then acetabular protrusion so that protrusion it's it's a very common presentation because head dislocation 
because of the potrucio head dislocation is quite difficult not like other so some, uh, most probably you need to cut the neck in situ and you need to use a corkscrew sometimes it, if it is difficult to take that you may have to cut and cut into pieces nibble the bone into pieces and get it out that is called piecemeal technique you have to use and when you are ream in the acetabulum we have to ream the periphery without deep in the socket to avoid causing added protrusion so we have to be very careful because the flow is very thin and already it's proximally migrate uh, medially migrated so you should not touch we have to ream around the periphery only and the, sometimes in the reconstructions of the anatomical hip center we have to use the, some medially we have to do some bone grafting to reconstruct the acetabular flow and sometimes we may use the oversized hemisphere cup sometimes if it is more medialized the offset so we have to use a lateral offset to compensate the medialized cup position in cotrochoid defect those are the things if you mention in your exam that examiner will understand your spectrum of thinking and sometimes you may have to use an anti protrusion cage and implant selection is very vital in this so we have to use the appropriate and we have to use or possibly we have to expect all possible that we have to ready all this and method of fixation cup fixation whether we have got a cement fixation or whether we have got a boning cup fixation so we have to be uh discuss about cones and cones if it is uncemented It's fixed. We have to fix with the supplementary screws for the acetabular cup to prevent uh, migrations, and that will help for the bone growth. So this is a, a, a antiprotrusion cup we can use commonly used in this, uh, and it's fixed with the uncemented cup with the screws. If you are using the cemented, so again it is. very difficult uh, sometimes difficult because as i said before it's very bleeding very in very difficult to produce a dry acetabulum to fix the cement fixation because because the bones are very bloody so it will compromise the cement inter dedication with bone uh, with bone so that is a very significant drawback in cement fixation in the pagetis stage so sometimes it is a very extremely poor bone qualities and significant bone loss so we may have to use the uncemented cup cage with augment with the bone grafting at the floor and then we have to put the cemented line inside so that sort of a vast range sometimes we may have to get involved the reconstructive arthroplasty surgeons involvement also very important if you mention that i will get my senior arthroplasty uh, revision arthroplasty surgeons opinion as well that will you that will shows that you are very uh, safe surgeon then uh, widening of the canal so I, as i said because of deformities you have to use extra cement you have to be ready with that and sometimes we have to use primary impactions of grafting with cancellous allograft tip it's a time consuming procedure and technically difficult because it's not a normal total hip replacement sometimes we have to use the large cement restrictor not as usual because of it's, it's a wide bone and sometimes we have to use a bone plug you have to be ready with all these things and sometimes we have to use a long stem long cement and stem sometimes the extensive quarter stem uncemented stem so be ready with all the type of instrument in total hip replacement with pages this is as i said to before aseptic loosen is the most common failure because what they are telling because of the uh, lithic actions is more in pages this is compared to this normal bone that's the reason osteolysis because osteolysis is the reason for aseptic loosening this osteolysis is more exaggerated in pages this is so high chance of getting aseptic loosening <coughs> in the um, aseptic so fixation is very very important initial fixation other thing is a uh, fred prosthetic factors be because of the in uh, abnormal bone fragile bones 
other thing is the heterotrophic cost of selection when you talk about the implant selection basically implant in the sense that whether it's a cemented or uncemented which is very controversial there are several people several studies give different different uh, uh, opinions but if you ready with the few studies and if you stick and whatever the type now several studies majority of studies they talk more towards uncemented fixation compared to cemented fixation because of it that bleeding will compromise this interdentations of cement with the bone because of this fact the more people more studies talk about that more evidence towards uncemented total hip fixation if for your exam if you ready with couple of studies so that is more than enough so because un, uh, even though these bones are abnormal their healing process is quite normal and the normal speed so normal bone healing bone integration is normal so it uh, it will not affect for this uncemented fixation compared to cemented fixation there is a one study it's quite common in the pavis is reported 21 cementless total hip replacement in pagetoid disease those are all stable with radiological evidence radiographic in growth at 7 years follow up and there's another study in australia in australia done by lasty that again uncemented total hip replacement had good outcome at 6.7 years follow up and there was a very later systemic review which is public in world journal of, of orthopedics in 2017 say april that involved eight studies that included eight studies involved with 358 patients with patches disease that shows uncemented total hip replacement their failure rate compared to cemented is very low and aseptic loosening that is the commonest complication failure in these patches disease total hip replacement so uncemented they reported only 3% at means of 15 years but cemented they reported 6% failure at means of 7.5 years so if you produce these uh, uh, studies and show so i will go ahead with this uncemented replacement that is so if you argue your answer then you are fit and examine with a good thank you very much Uh, thank you, Ajit. Uh, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive lecture. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I'll go through some of those. One is, uh, can you differentiate between the lytic, mixed, and sclerotic phases from your lab? Uh, I mean, investigations. Yes. What they are telling me is uh, this our um, orthopedic principal book that. Uh, Banaskovic that clearly says that this I, the investigation what I discussed alkaline phosphatase. Uh, if I go to that slide again, okay. yeah, hydroxyproline and telopeptide. Proline and yeah, telopeptide increases. Yeah, and telopeptide and uh, uh, C telopeptide all increases in the acute stage. It becomes reversed in it's normalized in the sclerotic stage. Okay, and in the mixer it will be somewhere in between. Yes. Okay. And uh, do, uh, what stages do you recommend the surgery? Definitely, it should be a mixed or sclerotic. I I I recommend for the sclerotic stage. It's quite safe. Okay. So, is there any cutoff value? For example, the telopeptide should be level below so much, or hydroxyproline should be uh, below so much, uh, or alkaline phosphate sure. should be below this much. Yeah. that uh, uh, none of the studies it mentioned that sort of a cut, a cut off study as such but they are telling it if it is no it's about the normal range so we consider the acute so we have to wait until it come but uh, i went through uh, it's not in the banaskovic as well and it's not in the any of the study they say this range is safer this range is so no studies to mention about that clear cut out of investigations right and you you mean to say that the risk of 
bleeding and other complications are going to be significantly lower in this chloronic phase. Am I right? It, exactly, yes. So all the joint replacements, any osteotomy correction should be planned only in this chloronic phase. Yes, yes. Because mainly because of the bleeding problem and next thing is the heterotrophic ossifications is also very common. Now imagine if we get the heterotrophic ossification, we will not get our intended desired outcome with the surgery. So we need to convert that to dormant state with the medical treatment and sclerotic state, then we can do the, get the appropriate result. And to reduce the incidence of heterotopic ossification, you have mentioned the use of vitamin C. Is it not endomethacin that uh, has a, a role in uh, HO? Yeah, endomethacin as well. Endomethacin as well, there are some vitamin C also has some effect, but mainly endomethacin. So sorry, but I, I couldn't mention about endomethacin there. Okay, you mean to say that there's a role for vitamin C in reducing the incidence of HO? Uh, Do you mean to say that usage of vitamin C reduces the incidence of heterotopic ossification? Let me just see. Sorry, sorry. It, it should be endometrosis. It should be endometrosis. That's a, it's a type in this state. Sorry about that. Okay. Fine, no issue. Uh, the other one is, uh, see, what do you think is the etiology of patients? There are a lot of etiologies. One is a para possible paramyxovirus infection. And yeah, uh, the yeah. other one is, what, what do you think is the reason why you do not see Paget's disease in this part of the world, where it is a very common disease in the UK? Yes. Because uh, what I feel that environmental factors, as, because there is an uncertain association with the cats and dogs. That's what I thought. But I don't know because there is no proven evidences or research to say this is uh, this is the reason for that. Because I was thinking this ceramics virus, measles, respiratory syncytial, it could be quite common in all over the world. But in the Canon, distemper virus is quite confined to the European countries. And another thing is, I thought it's the un uncertain association of cats and dogs. I really don't know, but. Yes, I do agree with you that it's very common in UK countries rather than in Asian countries. What about the uh, other countries in, in Europe? Because I've seen most of the publications everywhere comes only from the United Kingdom. What do you think the rest of Europe and the United States? Is it common there? Uh, I have to go for some epidemiolog epidemiological studies and to answer that question. So you know, see, not, see, yeah. The reason why I'm asking it's 2020, yeah. the year 2020, and we still do not know why people get pages disease. That's yeah. the only reason I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. So we have to look for some... We, we'll be late for further answers. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so that's much. Good, yeah, that's a very interesting question you asked. Yes, we need to look for why. We can do a study even. Yes, collect some few more, do a nice systemic review why it is quite common in the United Kingdom rather than other countries. Yes, good topic. Okay, Ajit, I think there are no more questions you've gone into very much into detail, especially the surgical part, which is supposed to be very, very important and which is not covered in other lectures. So really, thank you so much for being with us and discussing no about problem. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much, Isaac. We'll end the session for this time. Okay, thank you very much.